The Mexican television cameraman has done what thousands of people have been unable to. He was captured by a Mexican drug cartel and came back alive. One of those guys jumped into my car and started driving and they tied my my hands and my ankles and put me in the back of a pickup truck. Oh, no sabes en qué momento te van a agarrar. No sabes en qué momento vas a salir y te puede pasar algo. September 19th, 2012, Mexican journalist Luis Cardona was kidnapped and brutally tortured by a Mexican cartel. While he managed to escape in one piece, this incident changed the course of his life forever. And with Cardona, here are five times journalists escaped brutal cartel kidnappings. Alejandro Hernandez Pacheco. I'm really afraid. I can't go back and I left my family over there. I left my home. We talk about killing your family and what they were going to do to you. We heard them talking about how they were going to burn us in a car. July 2010, Mexican television cameraman Alejandro Hernandez Pacheco and a colleague were covering a riot at a prison in the town of Gomez Palacio in Durango State, northwestern Mexico. However, as they drove away from the prison, their car was stopped by Sinaloa gunmen who mistook them for members of the rival Zetas cartel. At the time, the Sinaloa cartel, led by the infamous drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, was in the middle of a bloody battle for trafficking routes in northern Mexico with the Zetas. In 2010 alone, more than 15,000 people died in Mexico's drug war, and in Hernandez's nearby home city of Torreon, where he worked for the local station Televisa, the government recorded 990 homicides, up from 62, five years earlier. Unfortunately, Alejandro feared he was about to be one more entry in that death toll, as he was forced out of his car and into the truck of his captors. Once he got into their truck, these Sinaloa cartel sicarios, convinced they were both working for the Zetas cartel, swore to kill him off once they got to their base, not minding their ID cards displayed while begging for their lives. By some form of miracle, Pacheco's head wasn't blown off the moment he reached a Sinaloa cartel safe house. But for days, he and two other kidnapped journalists were shuttled to a series of safe houses, where they were brutally beaten and threatened. Hector Godoa, a Mexico City-based Televisa reporter who had been working with Hernandez, was released on the condition that he filed a false report, detailing collaboration between government officials and the Sinaloa cartel's rivals, the Zetas. Godoa tried convincing Televisa to publish this story, however, they refused. In turn, Pacheco's captors forced him to do a video for YouTube, incriminating the Zetas by claiming that they had false collaboration with the government of Coahuila. Left with no options, Pacheco made the video, and it was sent to Televisa to broadcast overnight. While they complied, you have to keep in mind that no one, apart from Pacheco's family and his colleagues at Televisa, knew he had been kidnapped. So once the video was aired, local residents saw it and were shocked by the details and the government officials it incriminated. Seeing the damage it had caused, these Sicarios made Pacheco record another video linking more politicians to the Zetas drug trafficking ring. But this time, Televisa refused to broadcast that video. Their spokesperson sent back a message reading, We won't be responsible if something happens to him because we, the network, cannot continue to be hostages of the narcos. Their refusal pushed Pacheco one step closer to his grave. His captors felt they didn't need him anymore. And since he'd been around him for so long, letting him go freely might do more harm than good for him. So they drove him to their death quarters, a place where they kept victims to be killed. At this location, Pacheco met two other journalists, three policemen, and one taxi driver. All seven victims were cramped in a 4x4 meter room with their hands and feet tied up. They were given nothing to ingest except water, and they weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. It was a psychological torture. They were denied sleep and threatened constantly that their final days were approaching. But thankfully, the only thing approaching was the federal police coming for their rescue. But here's the catch. July 30th, 2010. The night before Pacheco and his colleague were released, they were taken to an isolated location where they were beaten so badly that Pacheco went unconscious. The next morning, they were taken back to that location where the hostages were kept. But by the time they got there, a few Mexican police officers were around to take him away. 
This all appeared really strange because the police officers didn't make any arrests and were quite friendly with Pacheco's captors. It seemed like a staged mission, and that notion was confirmed when Pacheco was taken straight to Mexico City, cleaned up, and set up for a press conference, with the police claiming the narcos didn't harm him, and they got to the location right on time to rescue him. That was all Pacheco needed to see that the Mexican government wasn't on his side, and that the Sinaloa cartel probably had some shady dealings with him. And if it hadn't been clear, he knew he was probably going to still be a target in Mexico. He began making calls to his relatives in El Paso and around Texas, hoping to get a good lawyer. August 22, 2010 Alejandro Pacheco and his family crossed into the U.S. with tourist visas, and the moment they entered, they contacted a prearranged lawyer, who began seeking political asylum. Luckily, they were granted citizenship, and Pacheco swore to never step foot inside Mexico ever since. Luis Cardona Back in 2012, Mexican journalist Luis Cardona experienced one of the most traumatic events of his life with his abduction at the hands of fake police officers and cartel members. Now, Cardona was a 66-year-old journalist and reporter for a local news station in Chihuahua. At that time, the then-president Felipe Calderón pitted various drug cartels throughout Chihuahua and Mexico against one another with his declaration of war against drugs in 2006. The city of Nuevo Casa Grande in Chihuahua, near the Sierra Mountains, served as the setting for the transfer of drug shipments bound for the U.S. of A. However, transporting drugs wasn't the most vile act. There were reports about people being forced to work in the marijuana and poppy fields in the mountainous area known as Triangulo Dorado. The workers wanted to quit for fear of the government's new regulations but were forced and threatened to stay. Nobody did anything about it and their exploitation went unnoticed, until Luis Cardona began digging deep into the case. In about a month and a half, Luis had documented 14 cases of people who were kidnapped by Mexican cartels and taken to that difficult-to-access region, located between the states of Sinaloa, Chihuahua, and Durango. He exposed in grave detail the hardships these victims faced and how everyone, even law enforcement, turned a blind eye to the inhumane treatment these victims were subjected to. Around mid-September, he released a report that was documented as case number 15, causing a huge stir of reactions from locals. And then just two days later, Cardona himself became case number 16. 11 a.m., September 19, 2012. A group of Sicarios dressed as soldiers kidnapped and took him to their HQ. When they got there, they locked him up, beat the living daylight out of him, and kicked him to the point where he just fell unconscious. Cardona woke up to injuries all over his body, and sadly, these men weren't done with him. They tied him up, put him in a truck, and drove him out to a hill with no cell phone reception. There they would beat him again, but this time with a whip used to beat horses. Those moments felt far worse than death, and to put an end to his misery, they wrapped a rope around his neck until he became unconscious. Thinking he was almost dead, Cardona was left on this hill to die for his sins against their crime syndicate. But fortunately for him, he had cheated the hands of death once again. After regaining consciousness, Cardona quickly descended the hill to seek help. He managed to make his way back home, and while he felt grateful to be alive after enduring such brutality, his career died with that attack. He became one of 500 journalists under Mexico's Journalist Protection Service, constantly living in fear and unable to find jobs anymore. You see, Mexico has gradually become one of the most dangerous places to practice journalism. Since the year 2000, more than 153 journalists have been assassinated in that country, while double that number disappear every year. Even worse is the fact that the government discredits the press, criticizes them for their lack of professionalism, and describes them as unfair and biased. Now, this development has given criminal organizations an upper hand in suppressing the media while eliminating anyone or any organization daring to report negative news about them. As a result, these poor journalists have been kidnapped, abused, tortured, or even issued death threats finding it hard to get new jobs because society now sees him as an added risk. For Cardona, he would work as a freelance journalist in various states, but nothing ever stuck. 
Employers refused to believe his story, either thinking he made it up or just dismissing the details altogether. As a result, he would struggle securing a permanent job with benefits. But that was just one side of the story. On the other, he was suffering severe spinal injuries due to the torture and beatings he endured. Along with seven fissures and four hernias, this was, of course, in addition to the emotional trauma he faced. And if this was a movie, you might have expected his story to be concluded at this point. However, reality proved more complex than any movie script, as his journey was far from reaching its conclusion. It was just the beginning. In 2019, after slowly rebuilding his life back together, Cardona had landed a job with a media outlet in Chihuahua. He was tasked with covering legislative and political conferences, given by the Mexican president Obrador every morning. Now, Luis finally had a stable position, with a decent salary. However, everything just took a turn during a work meeting with the president. October 17, 2019. Clashes and roadblocks occurred in Cuyacan, Sinaloa, with the involvement of corrupt Mexican army forces. The son of El Chapo had just been imprisoned and was expected to be extradited to the U.S. However, with the rising conflict, he was released. That morning, Cardona attended the president's conference and questioned him about certain facts and the potential release of El Chapo's son, Ovidion Guzman. His questions generated a lot of attention and put a target on his back. And when the broadcast was aired all over the country, he received millions of mentions on social media including many death threats. The authorities agreed to provide him with bodyguards for only two years, and then they took him away, despite the continued threats. The bigger twist here is that Cardona actually identified the cartel member who sent them those threats. He got him arrested, but the court suspended the trial, wishing not to continue with the investigation. Now, Cardona hops from one shelter to the next in fear that men might still be after him. He had to divorce his wife as she was also kidnapped a few years later in retribution for his work. Yeah, he might have lost everything, but he continues to fight. And no, his story's still not over. Jeanette Bedoya Lima. And speaking out on behalf of victims of sexual violence in Colombia, all women and girls are in your debt. That was Miss Lima receiving her award for bravery as an investigative journalist in Colombia. Now, why did she receive that award? Maybe because she was kidnapped and tortured not once, but twice. In 2000, the first time this happened was when 26-year-old Lima worked alongside Ignacio Gomez, another investigative journalist at the Bogota Daily Newspaper. Lima at the time was covering a very crucial story on the Colombian war against terrorism. While investigating a story on arms trafficking by both state officials and the paramilitary group called the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia. As part of covering her story, she received an invitation from a convicted killer simply known as The Baker. He wanted to meet with Lima and give her all the information she needed at the infamous La Modelo prison near Bogota. She would go with an editor and a photographer, but when they arrived, things would get crazy. The two co-workers would mindlessly step out for a few minutes while awaiting clearance from the prison wards to come back inside. But by the time they got back inside, Lima was gone. No screams were heard, no signs of struggle, and certainly no eyewitnesses willing to speak. Lima later revealed that she was approached by a man with a scar over one eye, who wore shiny shoes and who also shoved a gun right below her waist. He would take her out of that prison through another exit while the prison wardens watched on. Then a group of unidentified men beat her to a pulp, violating her sexually while repeating the words, Pay attention, we're sending a message to the press in Colombia. When they were done, they threw her semi-conscious body into a pile of dump beside the road. Luckily, she was discovered that same evening by a taxi driver who immediately took her to the hospital. She barely survived that attack and you'd think she would just quit or run away like any other normal sane person would, right? Well, not Lima. She was brave. She didn't want to quit. Instead, she went harder on her quest to uncover the truth. Sadly, that would lead to her second kidnapping, and this time, they went even harder on her. In 2001, a year after the incident, Lima was hired by El Tiempo, a Colombian newspaper, and was put in charge of its law enforcement coverage, including reporting on the war between the FARC guerrillas, the paramilitary groups, the armed forces, and the Colombian government. Before this, though, she had received international recognition from the U.S. for her unwavering commitment to her job. This recognition played a positive role in her career. It would serve as a form of protection from more 
violence. She would also receive a telegram from both paramilitary forces saying she had nothing to fear from them. The FARC guerrilla chiefs gave her similar assurances, but it was simply bait to lure her into another trap. August 2003 She went to the town of Puerto Alvira to report on how it had been taken and held by FARC guerrillas for more than a year, forcing its 1,100 inhabitants into full-time cocaine production. When they got there, the guerrilla leader ordered their kidnapping and took away their cameras, cell phones, and clothes. The leader also told the people not to speak or feed them. However, they would defy his rules. They gave them not only food, but also tried getting them help after they heard that their leader was planning to kill them. And once again, Lima cheated the hands of death as a senior FARC commander was alerted of the situation. He immediately told his people to release and apologize on behalf of the leader who did order that kidnapping in the first place. Lima had become a household name in Colombia, and messing with her wouldn't have just been a national issue, but one that would definitely bring questions from international organizations. That's partly the reason why Lima is still alive today. Lima has claimed so many awards and international recognition for her job that she is regarded as the face of journalism in Colombia. Jose Antonio Garcia November 20, 2006, Jose Garcia, known as El Chino, was on his way from Tepalsatepec to Morelia to see his family. He placed a call to his son asking if he needed him to get any groceries, but before his son could reply, he heard voices asking Garcia to hang up the call, and that was the last he ever heard of his father, until something unexpected happened. Jose Antonio Garcia was married to Rosa Isela Caballero, with whom he had six children. He was the founder and editor of the newspaper Ecos de Suenza in Tepalsatepec. He ran stories about drug trafficking in Mexico and police involvement in drug activity. He had compiled a list of government officials that he believed were involved in organized crime and had taken that list to Mexico City to get confirmation of his discoveries from Mexico's Federal Organized Crime Unit. However, making that journey only marked him as a threat to the very police officers that he was going to expose. This would happen six months before he was kidnapped, but in those six months, Garcia tried to get away from his family to protect him from being targeted by the people he exposed. They lived in Morelia, which is the capital of the state of Michoacan, so he drove about 256 kilometers to work every day, approximately a three-hour drive to the newspaper publishing house in Tepalsatepec. In some part of his mind, he might have felt traveling that long distance every day wouldn't make him a target, given that he was never handed any death threats, but little did he know that he was constantly being followed. And why wouldn't he? At the time, the state of Michoacan had become a hotspot for drug trafficking. Worst of all, it was occupied by low-tier cartels, such as the Knights Templar and La Familia Michoacana, which were unrecognized as serious threats when compared to their higher counterparts, the CJNG and the Sinaloa cartels. However, these cartels would do damage to lives and property within their locality without getting any form of retribution. For instance, La Familia Michoacana is known to produce the largest amounts of methamphetamine and clandestine laboratories in Michoacan, and have also been involved in countless violent clashes with their rivals. What's more troubling is that they control local politics within the area and have a say in law enforcement. And by the time Garcia began meddling in their business, reporting on their associates to the police, they would enroll him into their school of torture to teach him a lesson about who's actually in charge in Michoacan. On the day he got kidnapped, the last thing his son heard was the sound of his father being dragged away before the line went dead. Garcia never returned home that night or the next, and it wasn't until after a week that his family decided to take the matters to the same cops who many speculate had a hand in his disappearance. March 2007, four months after his abduction, no headway had been made. All investigations had gotten to a dead end, and his family believed to some extent that Garcia was already dead. But was he? The then president of Mexico, Calderon, intervened, asking the Federal Anti-Kidnapping Unit to investigate, but again, the lack of sufficient evidence didn't allow the investigation to amount to anything. However, some unofficial sources claim that Garcia is still alive and that he escaped his abduction. At the time the Mexican president got involved, La Familia Michoacana was in the middle of a power tussle amongst its leaders, leaving the cartel divided. Consequently, some of the victims they held in captivity for ransom were released, allowing Garcia to escape. And probably knowing that returning to his family and his home in Michoacan would make him a target once again, Garcia fled to another city in the heart of Mexico to start a new life and with a new identity. Some say he's still in contact with his family though, and that's why his wife has managed to run his newspaper so well. Others say that he died the same day he was abducted. But the question of whether or not he's truly alive is still a question we may never get an answer to. 
Marcos Miranda Coco. June 12, 2019, Mexican journalist Marcos Miranda was kidnapped in the port city of Boca del Rio. Thankfully, he was released, but it didn't come without a cost. Marcos is the founder and editor of Noticias a Tiempo, a news page that operates on Facebook reporting on general news including crime and security, in Veracruz, Mexico. He once worked for another news outlet, Noteved, but left due to their low level of competence. Consequently, starting this news page earned him a ton of threats. He told his colleagues about him, but they didn't really take it as a huge deal, until they came after him. A day before his kidnapping, Mexico was grieving the death of another prominent journalist, Norma Sarabia, who covered crime and police for Tabasco Hoy. Sarabia was talking to a family member in front of her home in the municipality of Huimanguillo, Tabasco, when a car pulled up with at least three masked assailants inside. One would get out and open fire at close range, striking her with at least four bullets. And while Marcos was writing reports on how Sarabia was killed, he became the next target. Around 9 a.m. on the day of the incident, Marcos was approached by a vehicle, thrown into the back seat, and then taken to an isolated location. He was brought to a room where his captors undressed him, took photos, and repeatedly struck him in the neck and head. The weird part of the story is initially they claimed he was kidnapped for being a gossip. However, shortly after, they informed him of a mistake and assured him that he would be released on their boss's orders. They placed him back in the trunk of their car, tied him up, and headed to another location. But on route, they were stopped by security forces forces who found their vehicle suspicious for traveling down a dirt road late at night. Once intercepted, a gun battle ensued, leading to Marco's three captors escaping on foot. He was later found and sent to a hospital to be treated for his injuries, just in case the captors would try to attack again. A patrol unit was assigned to guard his home and family. At the end of the day, though, no amount of officers would be enough to guard the mass number of Mexican journalists living in fear. A spokesperson for the Federal Mechanism for the Protection of Human Rights Defenders and Journalists once said that neither Sarabia nor Miranda were incorporated in a federal protection program and had not reported threats to the institution, giving the reason why they fell prey to these attacks. But on the other hand, there are dozens of journalists in this program who have succumbed to even worse attacks, with some of them not even making it to the news. When it comes to the safety of journalists, Mexico hasn't changed, and it doesn't seem to be changing. Certainly not while politicians, businessmen, and cartel drug lords as ruthless as El Chapo or El Mencho know that they can get away with murdering any reporter that they're unhappy with. For years, Mexicans have sung the same words, asking the government to do something, anything, but the story remains the same.